Due to technical difficulties, we are joining the program already in progress. Uh, they don't actually have、um, empirical data, but they do a nice theoretical model, and they looked at the notion of well. You have an attacker who's doing a brute force attack against your passwords, and if you have all your users change their password, then the attacker has to start over, and so that's going to slow them down if every 60 or 90 days they have to start over with their brute force attack. But they were able to model this and showed that actually it doesn't slow the attacker down very much. And in fact, you can have much better gains by using a slower hashing algorithm. That's going to be a much better way to slow down the attacker than to make everybody change their passwords every 60, 90 days. And by using a slower hashing algorithm, you're not inconveniencing your users. They also point out that if you have an attacker that knows your passwords, well, they can install a keylogger into your system, and now when people change their password, they can watch the user actually do that. There's also some survey evidence that shows that changing passwords on a regular basis may not be all that helpful. So、uh, there is some work that was done actually a while ago, but I think if you repeated this today, you'd find very similar things. Where users say, "When I know I have to change my password, I don't put that much effort into creating a good password in the first place," and so these users create weaker passwords. There was also a study that my students did at Carnegie Mellon University, and this is with、um, Carnegie Mellon users and their passwords. So we set up a system so that when people changed their password afterwards, they were asked to fill out a survey, and the survey asked them, among other things, how annoyed were they right now for having to change this password. And we were able to correlate this with the password that they had just created, and we were able to show that the people who said that they were really annoyed, really pissed off right now, they were the ones who had the weakest passwords. All right, so I took all of this evidence and I put it together, and I wrote a blog post about this, and it was posted on the front page of the FTC website. One of the cool things about being the chief technologist at the FTC is I get to post these blogs on the front page of the FTC website, and they actually get read by a lot of people. And my understanding is that this particular blog post got forwarded to a lot of system administrators, and I've heard that a small number of them actually changed the policy. Now I've also heard from others who said, "I'm, I, I might be convinced." But I still don't feel like I I can do this. I still might get criticism. I I need standards that tell me that this is okay.、Um, it's not enough just to see this on the FTC blog.、Uh, we got a lot of press coverage.、Uh, a lot of a lot of、uh, reporters were very interested in the idea that maybe this password expiry is not such a good idea. I'm not the only one saying this. In the UK, CESG has also been saying that they blogged about this recently, and they actually had a report that came out, I think, last year that explained why this was not necessarily such a good idea. And then in May, NIST came out with the preview of their new guidelines about passwords, which、uh, you will hear about in a session later this morning. But among other things, these new guidelines suggest that you don't have regular password expiry. So hopefully, we will have this as part of a standard that people can point to. So, if password expiry is not really going to help us. What will help us?、Um, there's all sorts of ideas that people have. I want to highlight a little bit of research that my students at Carnegie Mellon have been doing to try to understand how we can help people make stronger passwords. And one approach is to address misconceptions that people have about passwords. So we've done studies where we invite people into our lab and we watch them create passwords and talk to them about the passwords that they create. A really common misconception is that keyboard patterns are secure. 
we see people create keyboard pattern passwords, and they're so proud of them. Oh, aren't I so clever? This looks so random, but I just go diagonally down the keyboard. And some of those people will even say, yeah, I know if I went across the keyboard, oh, that's probably bad. But I went diagonal. Isn't that great? Um, we need to make people aware that that is a misconception. Another one of my favorites, adding exclamation point on the end will make it more secure. And of course, we all know that that, that is wrong, but we have seen users in our lab create a password and they say, oh yeah, monkey's not a very good password, but I'll add exclamation point on the end. Now it's really secure. We did a study online. Um, my student, Blaze Err, uh, led this study, and he presented it this spring at the CHI conference. In this online study, we gave people pairs of passwords, and we asked them to tell us which one is more secure, or are they equally secure? So I, we're going to have a little audience participation here. I want you all to try this. Okay, so I have two passwords, and you guys are going to tell me by a show of hands whether the one on the left or the right or whether they're equally secure. Okay, so we have I love you 88 and I eat kale 88. So raise your hand if you think I love you 88 is more secure. Okay, raise your hand if you think they're equally secure. And now raise your hand if you think I eat kale 88 is more secure. Okay, well, interesting. We, ha we have some uh, split decision here. Our study participants thought they were equally secure. Probably they looked at them and said, well, they're the same number of letters. They have the same numbers in them. They're kind of similar. But actually, IEKL88 is four trillion times more secure. <laughs> yeah. So why is this? Well, I love you is one of the most common words in passwords. It's somewhere really big on my dress, which if you haven't noticed, contains the 500 most common passwords from the Rock U data breach. Right? If your password is on my dress, definitely this is a time to change your password. OK, so, <laughs> so I eat kale 88 much more secure, or until now, um, <laughs> because apparently people don't eat kale or maybe they don't like to brag about it. All right, let's try one more. Which is more secure, Brooklyn 16 or Brooklyn QY? All right, raise your hand for Brooklyn 16, more secure. Okay, got a few hands. Raise your hand for they're equally secure. Hmm? And raise your hand for Brooklyn QY. Ah, a lot more hands there. OK, so our study participants thought that Brooklyn 16 was more secure, probably because they saw the numbers and said numbers and passwords are good. But as many of you knew, Brooklyn QY is 300,000 times more secure. And the reason for that is QY is a much less common thing to be in a password than 16. And so it actually ends up being more secure. So what we found is our participants were not completely wrong. So they knew to avoid common names and phrases. They just didn't realize that I love you was a really common phrase. They knew that digits and symbols were good and added strains to their password, but they, they were oversold. They, they thought that, there were, that they provided a lot more security than they actually do. And interestingly, at the end of our survey, we asked them about what types of attacks they thought their password would have to withstand. How many guesses do you think an attacker is going to make? Well, some people correctly said a really, really big number as many digits as they could fit in the little box we gave them. But there were a lot of people who gave us one-digit numbers for the number of guesses. In their mental model of the situation, they assumed only that online attacker and really had no idea that there were any other types of attacks that they needed to worry about. So if that's the mental model you have, it's going to be difficult to actually create a strong password. And a lot of this is because of the feedback that we give users. 
the password meters that are on a lot of websites don't really give users the kind of feedback that they would need to actually create a stronger password. You know, it tells you your password is weak and that you need to create a stronger password. Okay, how do I do that? Most of these password meters don't really tell you. Uh, so my students in Carnegie Mellon are working on an open source password meter that besides having a good scoring mechanism will provide what we hope will be really useful feedback uh, to the users. And that's, that's um, under development right now and hopefully you'll hear about it at this time next year. All right, so to wrap things up, I want to leave you with this URL. If you want to see my blog post about passwords and all sorts of other interesting things, check it out at ftc.gov slash tech. Okay, you find the, uh, the passwords blog. Uh, you can also learn about my experience with having my, um, my mobile phone account hacked, which was another exciting incident. Um, and I will leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you to Lori. I hope you enjoyed that one. Uh, she will be around, as I said, for the rest of the day and probably also tomorrow. Our next keynote speaker is Michael Kaiser from the National Cybersecurity Alliance. And he's here basically to help you. Earlier this spring, uh, they were doing the World Password Day. I'm pretty sure all of you know about that day. And he's here to talk a little bit what National Security, uh, National Cybersecurity Alliance can do for you, and some other stuff as well. So please welcome Michael Kaiser. Thank you, thank you, Pierre. You know, um, it's really an honor actually to be invited to talk to you all this morning. You are really an incredibly important audience when it comes to cybersecurity and to how to build a safe and trusted and secure internet, which is really what we're all about at the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Looks like we have this going here. Holding on for one second. It's okay. You know, I'll just start talking out about a little about NCSA for a second. We are a public-private partnership. We work with government, we work with industry, we work with NGOs across the globe to promote education and awareness in cybersecurity, meaning teaching everybody how to use the internet more safely and securely. It's up, it's up, it's up on screen. No, that's, no, that's not his view. That's a different view. Okay. So we work with companies all around the globe. We work with nonprofits like the Better Business Bureau, like Educause, which is the IT professionals on college campuses. Anybody here from Educause, there may be, or an IT professional on a college campus? And try clicking. There we are. So these are the core initiatives of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. I'll talk about these a little bit in a minute, but I'm really going to talk about creating a culture of cybersecurity. The Stop, Think, Connect campaign. Anybody heard of that? Yes, a few people. You should all know about this. National Cybersecurity Awareness Month. Everybody should know about that. And Data Privacy Day. These are all programs that originated out of the National Cybersecurity Alliance. Stop Think Connect was actually developed with the Anti-Phishing Working Group, or APWG, and I know a lot of you know APWG. Here's our board member companies. These are the people that support us uh, with funding, but also with um, some power. Oops, it's kind of going ahead there. Look. I'm going to talk a little bit about a culture of cybersecurity here, but let me give you some basic truths about cybersecurity. We are only as strong as the weakest link. It doesn't matter where you are in that chain. If you're just a home user or you're all the way up to protecting the most important government or, and, or uh, industry enterprise, any weak link affects us all. The other truth we hold to be self-evident is that cybersecurity is a shared responsibility, right? That all of us play a role somewhere along the way in doing things to make the internet safer, more secure, and trusted. We like to say that everything you do to be safer actually makes the internet more secure for everybody else, right? So that's a really important notion that we've tested with people and, and is very strong. But let's talk about how we talk about cybersecurity. This is how we normally talk about it. We make it scary, right? It's all these fear kind of notions. There are hijackers, there are viruses, there's crime. You could be attacked, you could lose things, you could lose your identity, all those things. These are the outcomes of 
bad security and we make it scary. We tell people, lock it down, don't use it, don't do this, don't do that. How many of you have teenagers and if you give them a don't rule, you expect them to follow it? Not gonna happen, that's human nature. When you tell people don't do things, they're not gonna listen. How many of us talk about putting up walls between us and what we want to do online, right? That's the way we talk about security. If you're in security, you need to talk this way, right? This is your discipline. This is what you do. But when we talk about educating people to be safer and secure online, if we tell them you're not allowed to do things, don't do that, they're not going to listen to us. So we should never be surprised when they don't follow the rules. But... What if we talked about security as enabling? What if we talked about building a safe and trusted internet isn't about stopping people from doing things, building walls around what they're doing, but actually good security allows you to do the things you want to do online. It lets you join communities, be connected with other people, it allows you to engage in commerce. It allows you to engage in content. And that's the way we start talking to people about cybersecurity and being safe online, about enabling them to do the things they want to do as opposed to stopping them from doing the things they want to do. This is a change in the way people talk about security. So, why would I have a picture of a telephone in a cybersecurity discussion? And not just a, a telephone, an analog telephone, a rotary dial telephone that's outlived its usefulness. Because when you think about it, the internet is a transformational technology, right? The technology we're doing is changing the world. Well, guess what? That device was a transformational technology as well, right? Before the telephone, the way we communicated people was totally different. And there's something about this POTS, or plain old tele telephone service, that was really critical to its success over time. And that was, when you picked up that receiver, there was a 99.9% .9 chance that you were going to get a dial tone. Right? That was what they lived by. And it was safe, it was reliable, and for the most part, it was secure. We can go into some discussions about that. Obviously, there are ways to get into telephone calls. But in general, it was considered to be secure. If it hadn't been, if it hadn't been all those things, the telephone wouldn't have been a transformational technology. And by the way, it took 40 years from the introduction of the telephone to like more than 40% of Americans actually had one in their house. When you look at smartphones, it took seven years from introduction to like 60% adoption. And in like 10 years, it was like 90% adoptions. So the way this transformational technology rolled out was also in a different time frame. But remember, the foundation of this was safety, security, and trust. That's what made the telephone a success. That's what allowed it to transform. And that's why we need security in the internet. So how do we go from this world of fear, pain, loss to the happy internet, right? The happy internet, we're all connected, everybody's doing everything they want to do on the internet, we're all, you know, we're chatting, we're texting, we're posting, we're making, e sending emails, we're doing work, we're connecting with families, we're connecting with people we've never met across the globe, we're creating communities, we're doing all those great things. How do we get there? We create a culture of cyber security, right? a culture of cyber security. What does that mean, a culture of cyber security? It means that you can move through the world doing all the things you need to do to be safe and secure online and that everybody learns how to use this technology safely and securely. That's what we need to do. So let's look at a couple of transformations that we've made, right? So we used to be a garbage society right? People got stuff, they used it, they tossed it in a can, right? Maybe it piled up on the street side. We all remember, maybe some of us are old enough to remember how big litter was as an issue back in the day, right? Maybe some of you, you know, know, you know, you'd go by the road, there'd be cans, there'd be bottles, there'd be garbage everywhere. Cities were disgustingly dirty. 
but we've moved, right? From a garbage society, we're on the path to a recycling society. Now, are we there yet? I don't think so. Are we closer than we were? Absolutely. I mean, you know, think of, think, can you think of the time that you were in a place that didn't separate at some, well, some level the garbage that you were generating in that space, whether it's a hotel room, a conference room, your office, right? So we're on our way to that. Whether it's at home, you have to separate the things. We used to be a smoking society. We had a smoking culture, right? You could smoke anywhere, anywhere you wanted to smoke. There was no rules about smoking, right? You could smoke anywhere, and it was perfectly accepted as a normative behavior. Is smoking currently a normative behavior? Are you on the right, are you normal if you smoke, or ab I don't want to say you're abnormal if you smoke, but really, generally, you know, it's agreed upon <clears throat> that smoking is not the social behavior that we're trying to encourage. Are we a non-smoking society yet? Not yet, right? Even here in Las Vegas, I think there may be some uh, casinos that don't allow smoking, some still do. Um, you know, we still have cigarette smoking available. It's been pushed to the side in many places, but we're moving in that direction. How long did it take to move in this direction? This did not happen overnight, right? Moving from a, to a recycling society, moving to a non-smoking society takes a, a whole bit of time. So how do we move from the panic of the internet, right? And this really represents the way I think a lot of people think about the internet. Oh my God, I'm going to be hacked. Look what just happened on my phone. How did this person get here? Why am I getting these posts? How come people are posting these things about me? Uh-oh, maybe somebody stole my password, right? We call that, our effort is stop, think, connect, right? We are looking at stop, think, connect as kind of that universal message for safety on the internet. We have stop, drop, and roll for fire safety. Stop, look, and listen for railroad crossings. Stop, drop, and take cover if you're from California or from earthquake country. This is a very simple message, which is explainable to anyone about being safe online. This is an Uber message. We'll talk about a couple other messages in a second. <clears throat> Let me say that very simply, it represents this. Stop, make sure you've taken security precautions, like upgrading your software, like <clears throat> strong passwords or multi-factor authentication like patching all your systems, right? Think about the consequences of your actions and behaviors online. Remember that much of security is not only technical, not only it's behavioral, it's what people actually do, right? It's what they post, it's what they share, it's the kinds of things that they do online. And then the connect piece is really simple. It's back to that thought of connect and enjoy the internet and enable yourselves to do the things that you want to do online right? And that's really what Stop, Think, Connect is all about. I will tell you that this message, which was created in 2010, was created by 25 companies and seven federal agencies working by consensus over the course of a year. We did consumer-based research. We went out. <clears throat> we talked to consumers. We, we tested a whole bunch of messages. <clears throat> Excuse me. We tested a whole bunch of messages across the eco with people. And this is the one that they liked the most. This message, and I'll talk a little bit, <clears throat> sorry, I'll talk a little bit in a second, <clears throat> talk a little bit in a second about how you can join this, but it's currently being used by more than 600 partners in 20 different countries across the globe. This is becoming the message, this is becoming the look both ways before crossing of security, and that's really what we intended it to be. So, thank you for the water, really appreciate that. Try not to spill it on the computer up here. <laughs> so I'll talk a little bit about more and stop Think Connect. But since I was invited here uh, by Pierre, I want to talk a little about passwords as an example around messaging that we need to look at, right? I think Lori did an amazing job talking about some of the issues, and she raised some of the ones that I think I'm going to talk about a little bit as well, but I think it's important to look at. So where do we go from here? I mean, passwords, even though a lot of people stand up and say they want to kill the password dead, right? It's not dead yet. I don't think it's going to be dead for a while, and it's still going to be critical, right? User, the role of users in developing passwords is not going to go away. We're not going to start assigning passwords to people at any time soon, so we're counting on them 
to know what to do and to do it well, right? That's still a really important part of passwords. And here's the good news. It can't get much worse than where we are today, right? We still know that password one, two, three, or one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, or password one, two, three, or I love you, as Lori pointed out, or last year, I think monkey was on the list, are still the most popular passwords. So the bar is very low for progress, <laughs> um, but we have to make progress. So why have we failed in passwords? What's gone wrong, right? So first of all, the long and strong passwords that we tell people to do are not designed for people with numerous accounts. We all know that, right? Too many, too many accounts, too many passwords, too many unique passwords. We are human beings. We are incapable of good memory. Um, just, you know, just as Lori showed, right, there's inconsistency in what sites deem a strong password, right? We as the community have not communicated clearly back out to our users what is a good password. And different sites use different ways for determining what a strong password is. That already, you lost me at different sites. If I'm a user and I have to have a different framework for making a strong password on every single site I go to, very, very difficult for me. There are too many messages about passwords, and I'll talk about this in a second. Um, advice is often technical, right? right? You can see people go blog how to make a strong password, and you'll see all this technical advice about how to do it. Do this, do that, add this, add that. Very, very technical. People do not like technical advice. When we did uh, the Stop, Think, Connect research, one of the strongest things that came back when we asked people you know, about being safe and signed, they said, give me common sense advice that's in my control that I can do and I will be more secure online and I will help you. We don't even have agreement on what makes a good password, right? We don't agree on this. Some people say you've got to have numbers and symbols. Some people say it just has to be long. Some people say you have to have capital letters. We are not communicating clearly to people what makes a good password. We all have ideas about what makes good passwords. As security people, we all have our own notions. We have some research which shows one thing over the other. But even doing the little test that Lori did, you could see that there's some disagreement in the room about what makes a good password. So we, as the messengers, and we are the messengers on this issue, need to look at that uh, in greater depth. The other thing is that um, when we create messaging, often you know, people will say, I have the perfect system for creating a strong password. How many of you have your own system for creating a strong password? A lot of us, right? How many of you have been asked to share that system with other people, <laughs> right? How many of those other people could actually use your system? See, some people believe that, but I'm telling you, for every, you can't have nine million systems for creating a strong password. That's too much to educate people on, right? So this is an issue, right, about how we educate. And I, I see this all the time. You can go look, there are tons of blog postings about, I have the perfect system for creating a strong password. And when you read it, you'll realize that no one else could do it but you. So good for you, right? But maybe not transferable to everybody else. And that's been part of the issues on the password piece. Oh, sorry, I got a little cut off here, but this is, so, this is sort of making some, this is looking at some messaging. So here's the way we've changed our messaging a little bit, right? Make a better password, not a long, it used to be long, strong, and unique, right? Make a better password. I guarantee you, not 100%, but if you start asking people, they will tell you they know that their password's no good, right? You don't have to have them because they know if you ask them, is your password any good, they'll probably say it's not. So make a better password. Just make it better. Whatever you want to tell them to make it better. Make it a little longer. Make it something like that. But don't just say every, you know, if you say every account after long, strong, just make a better password. Tell, get people to rest on their own sword. Ask them, how good are your passwords, right? They're going to tell you they're not very good. Okay, let's make them better, right? I think Lori really, this was her present, you know, only change them. Really, this is important. If you want them to have a long, if you want to have a strong password, only get them to change it when it's absolutely necessary. I think it really helps them remember it, under, you know, it, it encourages them to do a better job. I, we totally agree with that. Start by focusing on core accounts. One of the issues in messaging about passwords is that we say you've got to have long, strong, and unique passwords, right? 
Well, people could have 20, 30, 40, 50, 60 different accounts, right? That's not possible. So what is it, you know, in security, we always talk about, you know, protecting the core, right? Getting around, you know, building up layers. What's the most important account you have, right? For me, when we talk about this in the media and people to ask me about this question, I say the most important account you have is your email account and that should be the, that should be the account with the most strongest entry access as possible, the strongest way to get in. Why is that? Pretty simple, right? If I can get in your email account, then most likely I can reset your password on every other account that you have. So even more important in some ways than your financial account, and also your bank's probably doing a little more on the back-end authentication to make sure it's really you anyway to start out with. But those core accounts, we've got to focus people on the things that are common sense, that are in their control, and that they can do. Really important. And encourage the use of tools where appropriate. At NCSA, we don't promote tools, we don't recommend tools, but there are obviously a lot of tools out there around passwords and account access that can be used. We are certainly very much in favor of using other things beyond the password. We think that's really important. Right now, we're working with the White House and, so, and, and industry about developing a campaign that comes out of the Cybersecurity National Action Plan uh, from the president, about developing a campaign about educating people about stronger authentication um, and the many, many different ways that it will be available to you. But, you know, people have to also get ready to use those tools. They're not necessarily widely available. And we're not saying that just because a service doesn't use some form of stronger authentication that, that it's not secure, right? But obviously that's the way the world is moving. So that's some messaging that we can think about. Um, and then let me just talk about NCSA a little bit because that's what Pear really asked me to do a little bit so people know about you. We are the education and awareness folks. We do do a ton, we have a ton, ton, ton of materials that can make your life easier if any of you have jobs educating people on this stuff. We have tip sheets, we have posters, we have videos across many topics. We do all kinds of editorial calendars. This year we did safe and secure online digital weddings, right? Almost every bride now plans her wedding online. Why not get to her while she's doing that and teach her about other things in cybersecurity? You know, when you speak to a potential bride, she doesn't want to lose all the family photos, right, that were taken and posted online. She doesn't want all this personal information about her guests released to the public. So we do that, we do online travel, we do kids going back to school, we do all kinds of topics that we do all these kinds of materials about. On Stop, Think, Connect, which I'll also talk a little bit more, you can access materials that can be branded for, through a free license. Like I said, there's 600 partners across the globe to put your campaign with the Uber campaign, right? The FTCs, for example, their On Guard Online site, which is now on the FTC main site, uses Stop, Think, Connect. DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, is our partner in disseminating. We have many, many corporate partners from from Google and Microsoft and others who use this. We have tons of nonprofits across the country that are using. We have local police departments. We have uh, schools. We have municipalities. You name it, there are people who are doing this. And what this does is, what's really important in all of this is that we have a harmonized message. And that's what Stop, Think, Connect is, right? You cannot have 500 messages about how to stay safe online. People will not stick with it. That's what we learned uh, when we did the research for Stop, Think, Connect. Um, we organize the community around awareness. We have places that people can plug into us and tell us what they can do, what we're doing. And um, for those of you who don't know, we have a super active social media uh, presentation. We have, uh, and I got some resources at the end here. But um, by the way, my Twitter, my Twitter handle is at M Kaiser NCSA. And if you have questions and you want to tweet them to me today, I'll try and answer them for you um, or anytime actually. But um, please feel free to do that. Um, social media is very important to us. So here's just an example of like some of the kind of collateral that we connect, collect. These are mostly like web banners, all branded to Stop, Think, Connect, right? People can take these, these kinds of things, put them on their website, and direct people to their own resources. We don't demand that people, you know, reflect them to us. Just an example of the kinds of messaging we have, right? Own your online presence, really a message about taking control of your social media presence about, again, thinking about what you post. Make the internet safer for everyone, that message safer for me, more secure for all. Um, you know, uh, just some general things. And we do have many, many languages now of Stop, Think, Connect because it has gone global in many different ways. So, some of the things, like I said, Cybersecurity Awareness Month is in October. It's four, four weeks. Every week has a theme from staying safe online generally to uh, 
cybersecurity from the break room to the boardroom, looking at cybersecurity inside companies. We'll be looking at IoT, really not only IoT, very broadly the connected devices this year, from the connected car to the connected home to the connected enterprise. How are we going to secure that space as well? Um, we'll be looking at uh, some other issues as well. We'll focus on some special populations like seniors. Cybersecurity Awareness Month, which was created by NCSA and the, and the federal government, Department of Homeland Security, now is in Canada. It's EU-wide, it's a week in Australia, and it's being developed and promulgated throughout South America by the Organization of American States. We believe in just a few number of years that October will become the Global Cybersecurity Awareness Month for everyone. So that's what we're working towards. That is all organic growth on its own. Stop, Think, Connect, as I said, you can sign up for that. And Data Privacy Day in January. NCSA believes very strongly that security and privacy are deeply related. Um, our theme is respecting privacy, safeguarding data, and enabling trust. We believe that you have to respect personal information, you must safeguard what you have, and that builds trust. And so finally, here's some resources on us. Here's where you can find us. Please come and see us. Come to our Facebook page. Hit us up on Twitter. Ask some questions. I really appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I think you guys have a phenomenal crowd, a great conference. And please let us know in any way that we can help you make, make your work easier. Thank you.